everyone, and welcome to the third video in week two of our administrative law course. This week, we're looking at some of the old common law writs, which paved the way for our system of administrative law. In this video, we're going to look at a writ which straddles both administrative law and criminal law. It's called the writ of habeas corpus. We're then going to look at one final writ called the writ of quo waranto. Habeas corpus is one of those Latin phrases that you might have heard of before. It comes up from time to time, especially in US courtroom dramas. It means, bring before us the body. So you can guess in basic terms what this writ does. It enables a court to demand that a person be brought before the court. The court says, bring us the body. We're going to start our story of habeas corpus more than 850 years ago, in the year 1167. England has been under the rule of the Norman kings for a century. King Henry II is on the throne. He's the king who basically invented the idea of the common law, and three years later, he was the king who held the inquest of sheriffs and sacked virtually all of them. In 1167, Henry had some massive headaches. There had been a civil war in Normandy, which was the part of France which England was ruled from. That was destabilising. But even worse, a series of popes, starting with Pope Urban II in 1095, had been leading crusades to try to retake the holy lands of the Middle East from the various Muslim powers who ruled. Jerusalem was a particular target. Dying in these crusades was, according to the popes, a sure ticket to heaven. And who were the most effective trained warrior class in England? Why, the knights and the nobles, of course. Many, many of them swore an oath to participate in the crusades and headed off to the Holy Land for years at a time. So the very people who were supposed to be ruling parts of England for the king basically took off and left the sheriffs to do it. No wonder the sheriffs got out of hand. One of the powers which the sheriffs had was the power to simply arrest people, hold them in squalid jails and then put them to trial, including trial by ordeal such as burning or drowning, or trial by combat. Being a sheriff was basically a license to be a public sadist in the king's name. None of this made the king any more popular. And so, in 1167, he passed a series of laws known as the Assizes of Clarendon. Clause 4 of the Assizes read that if the sheriffs arrested a murderer, or a robber, or a thief, the sheriffs shall send word to the nearest justice through some intelligent man that they have taken such men, and the justices shall send back word to the sheriffs where they wish those men to be brought before them and the sheriffs shall bring them before the justices. In other words, the sheriffs were stripped of their power to hold people in jail and punish them. Anyone accused of a serious crime must be taken before the justices. Now, that would have been well and good if the sheriffs were playing nice. But as we know, the sheriffs were a law unto themselves, and so a person who had been arrested by the sheriffs and who was not brought before the justices, could seek a writ of habeas corpus. By issuing that writ, the court was saying to the sheriffs, bring us the body. We want the actual person, in person, their actual body, to be brought before the court. Not a good look for the sheriff if that body, when it turned up, was badly beaten or tortured or dead. So this is a way for those who have been unfairly imprisoned or detained to challenge their detention and seek their release. This concept was reinforced by perhaps the most well-known of all legal documents, the Magna Carta. It says in part, No free man shall be imprisoned except upon the lawful judgment of his peers or the law of the land. The sheriffs, though, still looked for ways around sending people to the justices. They would ignore the law if they thought they could get away with it. And if they couldn't get away with it, then they'd do things like delay as long as they could. 
Eventually, by 1679, the Parliament was becoming a very strong institution, and the Lords in Parliament had had enough. They passed the Habeas Corpus Act 1679, which stated outright that the sheriffs had been disobeying the rules and set in place stringent new procedures. That act, in substance, is still with us. It's one of the most important acts a parliament has ever passed. So what does any of this have to do with administrative law? Well, people are not only detained under the criminal law. Most notably, people in Australia may be detained under immigration law. They might also be detained under health laws, including mental health laws. And they might be detained under a range of laws that are similar to criminal law, but which actually live within the executive government, such as military members who are placed in military jails. And yes, Australia has a military prison at Holsworthy, just outside Sydney. Very, very scary place. In the age of COVID, which already seems so long ago, many thousands of people were detained for the purpose of quarantine. A person who is held in detention in Australia and who believes their detention is unlawful is still entitled to challenge that detention in ways that are essentially identical to habeas corpus. They can still go to court and challenge their detention. Let's look at a couple of examples. In Alcatab and Godwin, Mr Alcatab, who was an unlawful entrant into Australia, was held in immigration detention. There was an assessment process and it was determined that he was not a refugee with an entitlement to protection in Australia. The statutory provisions which enabled him to be held required him to be held until he was removed from Australia. So the idea is... Once it's been determined that a person may not remain in Australia, they can be held in custody until they're removed. The problem for Mr al Kateb was that he was a Palestinian man born in a refugee camp in Kuwait. You see, during the Six-Day War in 1967, many thousands of Palestinians fled from the fighting between Israel and various Arab nations and sought refuge in a number of countries including Kuwait. When Israel occupied parts of Palestine known as the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, the refugees had no way to get home, and there they've remained for 55 years. Mr al Kateb was not a citizen of Kuwait, and Kuwait didn't want him back. He was not a citizen of Palestine because that country does not currently exist in international law. He was not a citizen of Israel. He had no nation to return to. Holding him until he was removed from Australia meant essentially holding him permanently. He sought a writ of habeas corpus on the basis that if he could never be returned to any other country, then it made no sense to detain him under a law requiring that he be detained until he could be removed from Australia. Essentially, he was arguing that he was being detained until a condition was fulfilled but that condition was impossible. The High Court ultimately found by four to three that he could be held in detention. Not the outcome he wanted, but the power of habeas corpus is that he could bring the government before the court, in this case before the High Court, to test the legality of his own detention. The al story had a happy outcome in the end. After seven years in detention, he received a permanent visa in 2007, to remain in Australia. The al case was reviewed in late 2023 in a case called NZYQ against the Minister for Immigration. NZYQ was a Rohingya Muslim, part of an ethnic minority who were and are the victims of ongoing violence and even genocide in his birth nation of Myanmar. He arrived in Australia as an asylum seeker, was held in immigration detention for some months and then granted a bridging visa and released while awaiting a final decision. While on the bridging visa, he committed a serious criminal offence and was jailed. Whilst in jail, he was found to be a proper refugee, but due to the nature of his offending, 
he was considered a danger to the Australian community. And so he was denied a protection visa and placed in immigration detention. He couldn't be returned to Myanmar because he'd be in danger and no other country could be found that'd take him. Consequently, he too was in the al Kateb situation of ongoing detention with no prospects of release. Since al Kateb, another case called Lamb had been heard in which it had been decided that the only proper purposes for immigration detention were to hold a person while a decision was being made about their claim or to hold them pending deportation. The High Court adopted that reasoning and reconsidered al Kateb, finding that in NZYQ's case, he was not being held pending a decision about his claim for protection. That had already been determined. And he was not being held pending deportation, because deportation was not a practical possibility. This High Court overturned al Kateb and issued a writ of habeas corpus instructing that NZYQ must be released from immigration detention, an ancient writ given modern relevance. The last case I want to talk about is called Bolton and Bean. Mr Bean was an American Marine, a cook, in Vietnam in 1968. By all accounts, he wasn't much of a soldier. He pretty quickly started dealing in the black market in Vietnam and was arrested by military police. He escaped and fled from the city of Da Nang, where he was based, to the capital city of South Vietnam, Saigon. He linked up there with some other deserters who got him some fake travel documents and he travelled to Sydney. Once he reached Australia, Bean was a fairly busy lad. He had nine children by four different partners but otherwise managed to keep his head down and avoid attracting attention. In 1982, the US military tracked him down. They asked for the assistance of Australian military police to arrest Bean. You see, as far as they were concerned, he was still in the Marine Corps. He'd never properly been discharged. Australia and the USA had a treaty under which Australian military police would help to apprehend any American troops who went absent without leave in Australia. Problem is, Bean didn't go absent without leave in Australia. He went absent without leave in South Vietnam. Nothing in the Australian laws or treaties gave our military police the power to arrest an American soldier who had deserted overseas. And so Bean challenged his detention, seeking a writ of habeas corpus. The High Court agreed and ordered that he must be released. Very soon after the High Court case, though, Bean travelled voluntarily to the USA to visit his dying father. He was arrested off the plane, taken to the Marine headquarters, given a military haircut and a uniform, and then court-martialed. He received a dishonourable discharge from the Marine Corps and was out of custody about seven days after arriving in the USA in time to see his father. Can you see the power of habeas corpus? a right which was established in the Assizes of Clarendon in 1167 was used by an American deserter in 1987 to challenge the right of the government to hold him in detention. It was used by a refugee in 2023 to challenge his permanent detention. We are free people. We can only be detained if the law properly allows it. Habeas corpus says so. Finally, I don't want to spend a lot of time on the last of these writs, Quo Waranto, but it's important that you know it exists. Quo Waranto is Latin for by what warrant or by what authority. It was used when a person didn't want to challenge the decision exactly, but rather they wanted to challenge the authority of the person making the decision. To this day, as we'll soon discover in this course, one of the key questions we have to ask when assessing an administrative decision is whether the person who made the decision actually had the authority to do so. If they did not, then the decision can be successfully challenged. In Queensland, the writ of quo waranto has formally been abolished by Section 42 of the Judicial Review Act 1991. 
The High Court still does have a procedure for applying for a writ of quo warranto, limited to circumstances in which a person is falsely claiming to be a Commonwealth officer, but it hasn't been relied on for many years. So to this point, we've met five old-fashioned prerogative writs. Certiorari, which brings a matter before the court. Mandamus, which says go and do your duty. Prohibition, which says stop whatever you're doing. Habeas corpus, which says bring us the body. And quo waranto, which says prove to me that you have the authority to make that decision. We have one more video to look at this week. That video looked at what happened when the colonies of Australia became a federation. What happened to those common law writs when the constitution was implemented? One more video to go. I'll see you there. Mm -hmm.